Hello, everyone, and welcome to another live presentation here on my channel, Luis Borrero, Visual Artist. For those of you that are joining today, I want to thank you. And for those of, those of you that are coming by for the first time, thank you for coming by and please subscribe and share the content with your friends. Today, I have a really exciting presentation about underdrawing techniques used by the old masters. We're going to be exploring some of the techniques used by Bruegel and some of the northern painters that worked during the early Renaissance. So we're going to be talking about just some of the materials and I'm going to also be presenting a demonstration for, uh, you know, just to set up the, the drawing. And also for those of you that are looking for ways to just, you know, uh, get your paintings uh, rolling and get uh, just a basic technique down to get the drawing and the composition. This is a wonderful technique that was used by most, uh, I, I would say, for the majority of the old masters, they used under drawings in the early period of the Renaissance. And later on, by the uh, time that the Venetian painters were working, this technique was abandoned. So what is an underdrawing? Well, an underdrawing essentially is uh, a preparatory drawing that is used to set up the composition and is transferred onto a panel or a canvas using uh, red chalk, using black chalk, and there's various techniques that were used by the old masters to set up their drawings. So let's just go ahead and get started uh, with our demonstration. And But before I do that, I want to set up um, the references. I want to share the references and see how uh, these references have been formed alive, which is so important. Week after week, I do this. And it's really a key to uh, getting you know the references together and making sure that we are on track with that. All right, let's just go ahead and get take a look at some of the books that I have here. Um, so I have a wonderful catalog here that I'm going to be sharing. This is uh, Bruegel the Master. It's a catalog from the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but uh, it's, a, it's the, a world-renowned museum in Vienna. It houses a wonderful collection of Bruegel paintings and other masters. I had the opportunity to travel there years ago, and I picked up this catalog. Uh, actually, it was a gift, wonderful gift, and you know it's one of my most coveted books. And I'm also going to be, let's just take a look at this other amazing book that I have here. Uh, this is Durer to Veronese. It's another book that I have shared here before in, uh, during the live presentations. And this is 16th century painting in the National Gallery. It's a wonderful go-to uh, source if you're looking for sort of the evolution of painting in Europe. And it's one of my favorite books. I've had it for many years, and I've a lot of the information that I share on here I uh, get from this book. So wonderful book. I'm also going to be sharing a new source, which actually is not it's new here on the channel. Um, but by no means is new. A lot of artists are aware of Vasari, and he was a wonderful art historian and a wonderful artist during the Renaissance. Documented a lot of the, um, uh, you know, the famous artists. Uh, he has another famous book called The Lives of the Artists, and it's a um, biography on some of the great painters of the Renaissance. And Vasari in this book details a lot of the techniques used uh, throughout the Renaissance. So I'm going to be referring to, to this wonderful book. So let's just get started. Today I have um, a demonstration that focuses on uh, Flemish painters in particular, specifically Bruegel. I have a demonstration uh, demo that uh, was, uh, let's just take a look at some of these, these paintings by Bruegel. Um, Bruegel was a uh, 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 Flemish painter, Dutch painter actually, but worked in Antwerp. And he is considered one of the uh, most successful uh, artists, uh, Flemish, early Flemish painters. Um, he, was, he was apprenticed in uh, Antwerp um, to uh, Peter Koch van Elst. Uh, and he was in the, uh, the studio of van Elst for five years. And there he would have picked up a lot of this information, the information that a young artist would need to be successful, um, the preparation of pigments, uh, how to set up an underdrawing, 
and specifically the style, the style of, of Flemish painting, which is very different from uh, even a painter like Rubens that I shared here on, during our last live presentation. Now, the technique is very similar, and we're going to explore how the technique is fundamentally different in a lot of ways, very similar, but also uh, very, uh, you know, very different in, 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 in a lot of ways. And the, one of the most important things, aspect, when, uh, when you're studying uh, early Renaissance painting is the idea of the composition and how the underdrawing was handled. Now, these paintings by northern painters, uh, uh, spe specifically early 15th century artists from uh, the Netherlands uh, and uh, uh, Antwerp in particular, were handling the paint in a very controlled way. They were working with a white gesso ground, which I've talked about here several, in several occasions. Um, Rubens used a white chalk ground as well. But Rubens departs from this technique in, in a very fundamental way, and it's that he begins to draw freely with the brush. Whereas a painter like uh, Bruegel was still adhere to um, the, what he would have learned in the studio Van Els. Um, he would have dr drawn, done many studies, uh, drawn studies, and I want to share some of those studies with you. Um, here's some beautiful uh, studies, live studies, and they're pen and ink. Um, and these type of drawings would have served as sort of guides to establish underdrawings in paintings. Um, by drawing from life and, you know, getting the gesture of a particular figure, you could set up, you know, you could start to sort of imagine this collage of figures together. And artists would essentially, I mean, they would trace some of the other, uh, uh, you know, they would trace these drawings, their own drawings, and uh, they would tr trace many drawings and collage them together to create compositions. And that is the, you know, that that essentially is the the working method of the early uh, Netherlandish painters. Um, now, something that I found peculiar about Bruegel is that he, unlike many other Netherlandish painters that would transfer uh, the drawing and reinforce it with ink, um, he would work freely. Uh, he would set up the drawing, perhaps transfer it, and then. Uh, in, with white chalk, uh, excuse me, with black chalk, and then he would uh, just sort of work freely with the, the drawing on a white ground, and then once he had everything, the whole composition established, he would uh, perhaps start with uh, a, a earth color, seal the drawing in with the earth color, and then he would start painting. So um, now a lot of Italian painters would reinforce the drawing, the underdrawing with ink, with a quill, essentially. And I've talked about the quill in several occasions here in my live presentations. Here's a quill, and this is exactly what Bruegel would have used to, uh, to set up these drawings. But once the drawing was transferred, he would switch to black chalk. Uh, black chalk is very similar to a charcoal pencil. It's a, you know, it's a, it has a hard texture and it doesn't erase very easily. So if you're sealing in the imprimatura or the, the drawing with the imprimatura, you could essentially, you know, just protect the underdrawing underneath. Um, I've set up a demonstration uh, following one of Asari's techniques and that's what I'm gonna be sharing with you. Let's just, uh, before I do that, I just wanna read a little passage from Vasari that I've, uh, Remember that I like to do the historical and uh, also the, uh, the historical and the scientific. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at some underdrawings in a minute of uh, Bruegel so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, so in Vasari, uh, here I have uh, on page 231, this book is by Dover Publications, wonderful book, and he goes on to a to explain the drawing drawing by transfer or directly. It says here, after spreading the set composition or pigment all over the panel, 
the cartoon that you have made with figures and inventions all your own all, all on your own may be put on it and under this cartoon another sheet of paper covered with black on one side that is on that part that lies on the priming having fixed both the one and the other with little nails take an iron point or else or else one of of ivory or hardwood and go over the outlines of the cartoons, marking them firmly. In doing so, the cartoon is not spoiled and all the figures and, and other details in the cartoon become very well outlined on the panel or frame canvas. So this is the method that I'm recreating today. It's a wonderful method. Um, it's a method that was employed by uh, Bruegel and by a lot of Renaissance artists, Raphael, Michelangelo, a lot of the works that were on panel. Um, now, let me just before I go, you know, go on about this. Um, why would artists do this uh, on panel and not so much on canvas? Well, the panel uh, panel paintings are uh, by nature a lot more detailed. Panel has a smooth chalk and glue ground, and this surface is not very forgiving. Uh, you could. Uh, destroy the luminosity of the surface immediately if you put too much paint. And the, these artists were looking for this uh, beautiful white ground, which I'm gonna show you some details here. Uh, let me just go ahead and take a look at. So even a painting like this, wonderful landscape, Bruegel is essentially leaving uh, just the translucency of the pigments in this area right here. So this. The, the paint qualities in this area are just very, very translucent. Whereas down here, it's a lot more opaque, but even in areas where he's wanting the, the translucency, the paint is, you know, he's not covering the ground completely. That is essentially a departure from, uh, or, or the, excuse me, the Venetians departed from this technique in that they essentially were working with darker grounds and covering opaquely and then glazing on top. So that's really important to consider. So, all right, let's just go ahead and take a look at some uh, here. I have a, a detailed here of a wonderful painting called The Wedding, The Peasant Wedding. Let's just go ahead and take a look at And I'm going to show you some uh, detailed. Uh, actually, here's some underdrawing x-rays. This book is wonderful in that it shows some of the x-rays and you know, they're using scientific methods to just sort of um, an x-ray machine, and you can see there the underdrawing. Uh, maybe we could get a close-up here. Let's see. Uh, yeah, so there you can see the underdrawing, and here's the, the painting. So, and I also have some detail shots of um, that, I, that I found on the internet. By the way, another great uh, resource is the Detroit Institute of the Arts, and I was able to get these images of um, detailed underdrawings. There you see some x-rays from the Detroit Institute of the Arts, um, and these are wonderful little images. And this is important because, why is this important? Because um, you have um, two amazing little images there that demonstrate that Bruegel indeed was working with a very, I mean, it is an underdrawing, but he's using, and I imagine that there was a transfer and a very schematic transfer cartoon. Um, and then he worked the underdrawing um, right after the transfer. So he would transfer the drawing and then he would just sort of rework the composition before painting. And this is, you know, very different from a painter like Rubens. Uh, last demonstration that I did here on the channel, uh, I demonstrated how Rubens worked with the brush in a very sort of uh, free manner, uh, typical of Titian. And in, in here, uh, indeed, Bruegel is working in a sort of loose manner, but with a, with, with a black chalk, essentially. So it's, you know, it's, it's sort of a departure from the more traditional uh, technique where you transfer the drawing, and I'm gonna be showing you that process in a minute, uh, just the full process of transferring the drawing, doing a, a full cartoon, imagining that there's a full cartoon, 
and then uh, transferring and then you know getting a perfect drawing and then from there you just go on to painting so let's just go ahead and take a look at um, the demonstration I did a demonstration here the um, ink drawing, the cartoon, the cartoon, the drawing will have been reinforced with just black ink or bister. There I'm preparing the transfer paper with powdered charcoals and I'm just using just uh, powdered charcoal, spreading it on it, just a scrap piece of paper and I'm just rubbing the charcoal with a rag just to get that uh, paper saturated with uh, some vine charcoal. This is vine charcoal. And that is essentially my carbon transfer paper. It's a homemade uh, carbon paper just like uh, Vasari is describing. Now if you want to saturate it some more, you go for a second pass. You put more, more pigment on there and you just make sure to rub it and rub it and rub it and then you uh, wipe the excess off. Uh, because if not, it'll, it'll uh, it could stain the panel with charcoal. Okay, so once I have that completed, now this is the chalk and glue panel that I've talked about before, and I will scrape that panel. This is essentially the technique of the Flemish masters. Chalk and glue ground, let it, you let it dry, and then you scrape it smooth. And this process cannot be understated. This is important because the drawing will go on there very beautiful, very, very nicely, and it'll be ready to uh, there I'm wiping off the excess, making sure that the surface is perfectly clean, okay? And uh, I'm going to go ahead and transfer the drawing. There's my carbon paper. The carbon paper goes face down. And my cartoon, my fully finished cartoon, assuming that this was drawn from your life studies. In this case, this is uh, the Peasant Wedding uh, by Bruegel. And it's just a copy that I did just to demonstrate the process. I'm fixing it. I'm using tape, but there I'm, I'm using the tacks, just as Vasari describes. Just to, This is to get the registration perfect. If you don't do this, the paper could slip and you will run into problems getting the drawing correctly on there. And there's my stylus. It's essentially a piece of metal. Okay, I have a silver point on the other end, but I found that the... Uh, piece of metal sharpened with a file was indeed more successful. I was able to get a beautiful fine line and there I'm tracing over every single line in a gestural way. I'm sort of just drawing with the stylus. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm being very conscientious of the contour. It's a very simplified contour. Um, I imagine that and there is the underdrawing. Uh, I'm using a feather to wipe off the excess charcoal and I'm doing this right before the imprimatura. Let me go ahead and show you here. I'm going to show you. Let's see. So this is the cartoon that I did. Okay. You just saw the whole process. And this is a very complex composition. Now let's talk about why artists would have used a cartoon. Um, by the time that the Venetian painters Titian and a lot of the Giorgione, um, they did away with this process. And they would essentially, they would, they would still do um, uh, gestural drawings, uh, charcoal studies, figure studies, and they would assemble them together by drawing directly on the canvas. But a painter like uh, Bruegel would have set up the whole entire drawing in a full, fully figured out composition. The reason is because this panel, this chalk and glue panel is just not very forgiving. Let me just go ahead and got that backwards here. Okay, so here's the result. And um, you see that it's just a very, very beautiful, um, just very clean drawing. Now there's two ways that you could do this and um, I didn't really find a pattern uh, one way or the another or another but essentially it seems like some artists would, uh, would put the under drawing directly on the gesso uh, ground and then they would seal the drawing on top 
uh, excuse me, underneath with an imprimatura of lead white and or perhaps a, uh, an earth color and, and uh, plenty of linseed oil to seal off the very absorbent gesso ground. They would let that dry and then on top they would start their underpainting, their monochromatic underpainting. Okay, now some other artists would seal, it seems like they would seal, let me just get my other panel here that I prepared dropping stuff all over the place sorry about that um here's a prepared sealed panel just like very similar to rubens it seems like brugel uh wouldn't leave the streaks that i have here but he would have transferred the drawing perhaps this is another method that you could use and you could transfer the cartoon on top of that uh sealed panel and, you know, with a stylus uh, or even, you know, any, even a, a just a, a quill and the carbon paper, you could essentially just reinforce the drawing and um, get that drawing on there beautifully. Once you have the drawing on there, then you could just uh, reinforce the drawing with either ink, such as uh, Raphael did, uh, you know, he, Raphael, use a very different method but it was similar he would uh, reinforce the cartoon and I'm just going to go ahead and uh, demonstrate that indeed now Brugel would not have used the ink okay but you could use you could reinforce this cartoon with the ink and why would you do that well if, if you're putting a very dark imprimatura then you could see the underdrawing if you know, you run the problems. If if you are using too much oil, it could lift some of the charcoal. But um, in th in the case of Brugo, it seems like he used black chalk. He reinforced this with black chalk, and this is essentially uh, a technique that you could use uh, to establish your own drawings. Um, now, the black chalk is almost like a graphite. It will not. Um, you know, if you're sealing this with any sort of liquid medium, the graphite will not lift. It will actually stay. And that's probably why they use. Now, I use vine charcoal here. So if I seal this with an imprimatur, it will probably lift off a little bit. So it's. It, I would probably want to reinforce it with either black chalk or ink just so the drawing is, you know, intact underneath. So that's essentially uh, one of the techniques that was employed by... Uh, Brugel. Also, uh, there's another technique um, that you could use, and it's essentially taking your cartoon, and this is a technique that was used by fresco artists, and I don't find that it's effective. I believe that it's probably a lot more cumbersome, but you could take your stylus and go through every single line with little dots, okay? And once you've completed everything, which is very tedious process, this is, this is the way that frescoes were transferred. Um, you could take your pouncing bag, okay? This is the pouncer. And this is, right now this is filled with black chalk. And you could tap it, tap the entire drawing, okay? And the charcoal would fall through. And I've, I did a little bit of pouncing on this drawing, on this side. You, the camera doesn't probably pick that up, but there's some tiny, tiny little holes. And let me see if you could, the camera could pick it up. Let me see. So there, I went through every single line with tiny little holes, and the charcoal would fall right through that onto the to the panel. And then you could reinforce that with a brush, with ink, or with oil diluted oil paint. So those are various ways. Now. Are artists using these methods today? Well, not many artists probably are using these methods because now a lot of artists transfer their drawings with a projector. And But in the old days, this was very labor intensive. Artists would have to spend hours setting up these drawings, these cartoons, which are in, unto themselves works of art. I mean, I've seen plenty of uh, cartoons in museums and they're just wonderful e examples of how artists use their creativity. Uh, did Bruegel work out? Let me just go ahead and 
find the original painting so you can see the finished product here. Um, let's go ahead and show you. It's so important to get to see the, the work in context. Let's see here. It's a wonderful, you could just see this, these uh, very complex compositions and you know it's it's uncanny just to see how an artist uh, with just charcoal, uh, just some very very sort of primitive means, which would would be able to uh, come up with these very complex compositions. Here's just show you here. This is another wonderful painting. Um, look at look at the complexity of this. This would be very difficult to just uh, you know just to start drawing. From your imagination so you would have to you know even this figure right here is just a one wonderfully observed and most likely he transferred the drawing then brought in the model and modeled the forms or perhaps he modeled the forms from his imagination some areas feel like he was uh working from imagination even this painting feels like this is an imaginary space um there is some observation there going on but even that horse just feels imagined and just the, the amazing composition. Now, these paintings are uh, rich compositions. You know, they're, he was, that was his, his uh, forte. And there's the wonderful painting that, I, that, I'm, you know, uh, that I'm referring to. Um, just an amazing, The Peasant Wedding by Peter Bruegel from uh, 1567, one of the last paintings that he did. And there you see the complexity of the spaces. I mean, this figure is just so beautifully realized. And I saw this painting in person. The surface is just impeccable. So that's one of the reasons also there's not a lot of pentimento. Um, I talked about pentimento a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's essentially just correcting and reorganizing the, uh, you know, the, the, the drawing on uh, correcting it right on the surface, just like so just as the Venetian painters would do. So that's not the case here. The case here is that it's a very well figured out uh, drawing. And let me just show you the x-rays. There's an x-ray right there. There's the, the figure, the painting, and then the x-ray. And you see that there's not there's no correction. And that's the reason that they would use a very extensive underdrawing. Um, it's so I mean, the cert they're using sort of veils of, of washes of oil color. There are some areas that are very opaque, but some areas are also very, very translucent. And uh, when I looked at, uh, I had the opportunity to study his paintings in person, I observed that there's, he uses a lot of that under layer, the wash to sort of leave areas, um, just give it space, you know? So just a wonderful technique, wonderful artist. Um, I'm hoping to do a course uh, very soon on Flemish, a full course on Flemish painting techniques. And I'm going to be uh, finishing that copy uh, as an example. So before I go, I would like to tell you a little bit about um, my online live courses, which for a lot of you that are coming by and are, are uh, here week after week and learning a lot of these skills, um, how do you put all this into context? How do you uh, create your own work? And, you know, it is it is very difficult uh, for an artist to establish a vision. Um, so uh, for the past 18 years, I've established uh, classes in my studio uh, to help students uh, set up their portfolios and help them with drawing and painting skills. And uh, I pride myself and a lot of students that I've helped um, a lot of these students have gone on to college programs. And uh, recently, I'm launching uh, an online live class for the first time. I, I've been doing it now for uh, six months. But in starting in January, we're going to have a very st well-structured class. Uh, I also have my classes on Udemy. For those of you that are coming by the channel and are wanting to uh, get personalized critiques, uh, you're able to do that uh, by just logging on to luisborreroart.com. Uh, there you can sign up for my private classes online. 
Um, how are these classes different from my Udemy courses? Well, uh, I'm, it's a one-on-one -on -one or a small group and we do individualized projects and I'm also doing the critiques and I offer you a full curriculum. So this is really, it's, it's at first when I started the project, it was, you know, the technology is uh, difficult and we're right now in a uh, pandemic. So uh, you're a little suspicious of how the classes are going to run, but uh, it has it has been amazing. A lot of artists have, uh, uh, you know, signed up for the classes and they've done amazing works. I do full demonstrations in these classes. And of course, these are wonderful uh, initiatives, the lives here on YouTube, but by no means they could replace a full um, curriculum class. So now my courses on Udemy are well structured and they're pre recorded and they're wonderful as well for those of you that are just wanting to get started. Uh, and perhaps on your own. So I highly recommend them. If you uh, want more information, you could find in the description below, you can find uh, some links to the different courses. And um, for those of you that are looking for something a little bit more in depth, then perhaps you're interested in signing up for one of the uh, online live courses. So, well, um, for those of you that are here week after week and are uh, coming by with your questions and your wonderful comments. Thank you for your support. If anybody has a question or a comment, uh, you could just write below and I'll be happy to answer, you know, uh, any questions that you may have. Um, also, you could just uh, log on to luisborreroart.com, write me a private message, or you could find me on Instagram, luisborreroart. So, all right, well, thank you very much. I uh, hope everyone's safe. Have a wonderful weekend and thank you for joining. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, make sure to subscribe and share the content with your friends. Have a good one. Thank you very much.